Hello. If you've been following this channel, then you'll know that I'm a painter, by which I mean that I've spent about the last two decades trying to find interesting, intelligent games to play with paint. And in the course of doing this, I've discovered for myself that oil paint seems to be able to hold meaning in a way that other artistic mediums simply cannot. But this isn't going to be a video about any of that. This isn't going to be about creativity, and I'm not going to try to suggest the many ways that your imagination might take you when you become a bit more confident in using oil paint. This is going to be a purely technical explanation for those who are interested in how to achieve an almost photographic likeness with oil paint using a comparator mirror, whether it's your own or one that I've sent you as part of my research project. By way of an example, I'm going to be painting this image of Robert Redford, who happens to be my mum's favourite actor, but I've actually chosen it because it has really good tonal range. There are very dark darks and very light lights and lots of tone in between. I also think that some of the facial details might just allow me to begin to explain the finer nuances of portraiture, perhaps even talk about why and how paint can go so much further uh, than a pure photographic likeness. That might be jumping the gun a bit though, we'll just have to see. When that image is complete, I'm then going to go on in a second video and paint the same image again for you in colour to explain how that problem is sorted out in isolation. No matter what anyone may tell you or what you may think about purely realistic painting, it is only ever about sorting out three problems. The first is the problem of shape or of composition. The second is the problem of tone or light and dark, and the third is the problem of colour. If you can tackle these three problems with confidence and diligence, you will end up with a more or less photographic looking image. The problem is that so many people lack the confidence of experience to see the whole process through, or even to begin to paint in the first place, and that is where I've discovered that the comparator mirror comes in really, really useful. To get things started then, I'm going to run through all the equipment you will need to make your comparator mirror painting, and then I'm going to talk about paint mixing on the palette. Pre-mixing all of your tones before you begin to paint means that you have already pretty much tackled one of the main three problems, the problems of tone, before you begin to put brush to canvas. Hopefully that will give you a bit of a confidence boost before you even begin to paint. So let's get down to work. First, you'll need a palette. You can use any uh, hard flat surface for this, but I prefer the back side of a sheet of glass because it's just easier to clean. Then the brushes. This is a quarter inch round hogshair brush, very old, but very useful. Then a quarter inch nylon haired filbert brush. Next is a quarter inch synthetic sable flat brush, ideal for blending. And finally, a three millimeter filbert brush. Now you can vary those a bit, but uh, they're the four I like to use. Next is white spirit that will be used for cleaning the brushes and also for erasing uh, and manipulating the paint on the surface of the picture. You'll need a rag. Uh, I prefer to use cotton because it's more absorbent. A piece of towel is ideal. And of course the paint. This is standard titanium white oil paint from De La Rowney and lamp black from which you will be mixing all of your gray tones. You can really use any brand of oil paint that you like. Next, you will need your comparator mirror setup. So if you're participating in my research project, I will have sent you one of these prototypes, although you may be painting with a setup of your own. Either way, the first principles don't change at all. They cannot change. So what I'm going to say here will apply. Essentially, the source image needs to be stuck very simply and very firmly to the source plane, which is almost always the upright plane. And then finally, you'll need something to paint on. I'm going to use watercolour paper primed with PVA glue. This means that the oil paint and the uh, white spirit don't leach into the paper and you can manipulate the paint more easily on the surface of the picture as you paint, so that putting the paint down is just the beginning of the story. So I'm doing this uh, to show you a really, really useful technique. I'm using a moist, clean brush to manipulate the oil paint on the surface of the picture, which of course, remember, I couldn't do if I hadn't primed the surface with an oil resistant medium. I'm using a sort of sweeping motion, as you can see, 
and I'm only working the surface for a couple of seconds before dipping and re-cleaning my brush. The other thing that this means is that you can rub things out. You can get rid of anything you're not happy with and that means that you can have an infinite number of goes at getting things exactly the way that you want to. I'm not going to say getting them right or wrong and you can see here uh, if you really want to you can get rid of the whole thing and begin again. It might be a good idea to try this technique a couple of times before beginning your painting. I'd certainly advise it because if you can crack the knack of it, it really does reassure you to know that you are in control of the paint and not the other way around. OK, let's talk about paint mixing. We want a little bit of black and probably two or three times more of the white. The black goes an awfully long way, so be careful of how you mix it into your white. Otherwise, you'll end up with a great big blob of grey and have to start again. So the black and the white, of course, will be the top and bottom of your tonal spectrum. Now in the middle, very carefully mix three descending tones. As you do this, you should have your source photograph close at hand and you can move your spatula or your palette knife between the paint you're mixing and the actual photograph to physically match it. Now, for those of you who have seen Tim's Vermeer, you'll know that you cannot match tone like this accurately if your source photograph is a couple of feet away. So don't be afraid to move your palette knife covered in paint right over the top of your source photograph. If you do this closely and carefully, it stops you from having to worry about whether or not you've got an accurate paint mix as you're painting. And that's what I meant. You've already solved the problem of tone before you begin to paint. Then you want to put all five of these mixed colours in a nice neat row and clear back the rest of the palette because you may want to mix the occasional tone, a mid, mid tone if you like, on the clean section of the palette. OK, with all the preparation properly taken care of, let's just get down to the painting. So uh, to begin with, let's talk about the tones that we've mixed. We've got five of them on the palette. Let's call white number one and let's call black number five. At the moment, I'm blocking all of this in with tone number three. And you can see I'm really not interested in detail at this point. I'm blocking in the large areas of tone just to give myself the best possible scaffold uh, from which to continue on with the painting. One of the things that's helping me to do this is that I'm using the biggest and roughest of my brushes. I'm using the quarter inch round hog's hair brush, which you'll see in detail in a moment, uh, is, is, is you know, a pretty uh, crude looking thing, but it's, it's good. It keeps me from getting too caught up on the details because I couldn't possibly achieve them with the brush. There's only one thing I can do, and that's to um, put up a sort of painted scaffold. So in a moment what you'll see is that I, uh, I begin to put in the edge of the face. Um, I thought that that was, a painting is always an experiment no matter how much experience you've got and I thought that if I put in the profile of the edge of the face it might give me an idea of how the head is situated in the picture. And here you can see uh, this brush is probably four or five years old and um, it probably cost me a couple of pounds you know uh, two or three dollars uh, it's not expensive at all I think this might be a good point to explain to those of you who've never used a comparator mirror who perhaps feel very unconfident about painting exactly how the comparison uh, between your source image and your painting is made you see my head moving back and forward there over the mirror. I'm comparing my source image, which you can see upright, to the surface of my painting, as you can see in this shot. What I'm doing is I'm looking carefully into the mirror. I'm trying to remember where a mark goes. And then I'm being bold and placing the mark. Then after that, I'm moving the mirror back over and checking what I've done. Actually, that mark's slightly off, but it doesn't matter at this stage. I know that everything can be adjusted because the oil paint stays wet using the technique that I showed you earlier, the sweeping technique. So I'm using the mirror as my guide. Make the mark, check it with the mirror, move on to the next mark. My guide not only to achieve accurate shape, but to achieve accurate tonal values and you'll see in the next video accurate color 
As you watch this early stage then, just remember that each brush mark I'm putting down is just the beginning of the story and will be adjusted and tweaked as I go along. Now it may be another few hours until the painting is coherent enough to begin to speak for itself. And if I were a less experienced painter, I might start to feel that I'm in the wilderness slightly. The difference here is that with the comparative mirror as my guide, I never need to feel lost. The answer is always right there in the mirror. I just need to keep checking back and forth and enjoying the process of building the painting up. It's also worth pointing out, as I have done in other videos, that this kind of painting by comparison is in essence no different to the sort of painting that you would do if you were making a portrait in the traditional way except that the distance of comparison there is much greater somehow reducing the time and distance between what you want to paint and what you're painting on makes the whole process a bit more comprehensible easier to get to grips with in any case just rest assured that you are training that instinct with every moment that you spend using the comparative mirror you might already like to think about how you would extend beyond the comparative mirror when you become more confident with these techniques. So you can see here I'm putting in tone number four and one of the things I'm going to do uh, is resist using black until the very end of the picture. This is the darkest tone I'm going to use um, until much much further on. I find that if you can resist uh, using the the biggest gun in your arsenal until the end um, you you've done yourself a great favor because black is such a a strong uh, element to add into the mix it can very easily overpower the more subtle tones you've put in and you actually just end up with a great mid sort of mid gray mess um, so yeah just save your black if you can uh, for the finer nuances and it will come in later. So here you can see I'm just checking uh, my that my approximations of tone are about right. That my tonal values are more or less there and that I've put the tone in more or less the right place. Now this is the first uh, instance of me trying to sort of begin to chew at one of the details. So I've put that mark in, the darker mark there with the hog's hair brush, and I'm just gonna try and refine it with the, um, the, the moist brush sort of, sort of sweeping technique that I showed you earlier. So I've just pushed the paint back slightly and then I saw that if I carried on with it, I would get, end up getting um, tied up in, in just fiddling with that corner of the ear. So I, I thought better of it. And, you know, even though I'm an experienced painter, that still happens. You still sort of kind of find yourself all of a sudden becoming neurotic about uh, a certain detail. It's funny how people get more neurotic about the details of eyes, nose and mouth. Um, it's, it's something I've had to train myself away from because I think, and this is just my opinion, that good portraiture pays equal respect to el every element of the, the person that's in front of them. So, you know, the corner of a cheek or someone's temple or the shadow of the, under their, sh uh, their chin um, is just as important in achieving a likeness as a nose or an eye or a mouth. And here you can see I'm just beginning to get involved in the next stage, which is that I've cleaned my brush off, just wiped it on the rag a couple of times, and I'm beginning to pull all those tones together. And look at the difference that it makes. What were big islands of tone now begin to come together, and it's time to use my smaller brush, my three millimeter synthetic filbert with a long handle. To see how I use this filbert brush and to see the painting concluded, please now go to part two of this video to be found below this one. Thanks very much for watching.